Well, let's get more on the earthquake right now. I'm joined by Jason Patton via Skype from Arcata, California. He's a geophysicist with the consulting firm Temblor and is also a lecturer at Humboldt State University in California. Jay, thanks for joining us. This was a 7.5 magnitude quake. Put that in perspective for us. Uh, how did, does this quake compare with that disaster in 2004, which of course hit a much wider area around the Indian Ocean? Well, earthquake magnitudes have a logarithmic scale. So a magnitude eight earthquake releases about 32 times the amount of energy as a magnitude seven earthquake. So this earthquake was much, much larger than the 2004 earthquake. So this earthquake was followed by a tsunami. Uh, there was an early warning system put in after that 2004 disaster. Did it not work this time? Apparently, the tsunami early warning system was offline. However, uh, people who live in earthquake country and live near the coast, they would do well to know that they uh, that the earthquake is the their warning. So if one is in that situation, if the earthquake shakes, if the ground shakes for more than 20 seconds, that they should evacuate to high ground. So how much time would they have had between uh, becoming, uh, it becoming evident that there was an earthquake and that tsunami hitting the coastline? Well, the official um, announcement is that there was between eight and 10 minutes between the earthquake and when the tsunami arrived at the coastline in Palu. Uh, other locations, the, uh, the tsunami would have arrived sooner. If we look at the geography of this particular part uh, of the ocean, is there a particular fault line that lies off the Indonesian coast that makes the country so vulnerable to earthquakes? Yes, the Palu Koro fault is a known active fault, the most active fault in Sulawesi. It has a slip rate, which means the plates move side by side about 42 millimeters a year. For people familiar with the San Andreas Fault, a well-known fault in California, the, that plate, those plates slip at about 25 millimeters a year. So this is a very active fault. There is prehistoric evidence for earthquakes of this size and uh, there have been earthquakes of similar magnitude in the last century. So we know a lot of information, as you've been pointing out to us, about this uh, fault line that lies off the uh, Indonesian coast. So what does that tell us in terms of uh, how closely we can predict when an earthquake is going to happen? Well, that is something that, uh, we, that we do not currently have the ability to do. It is not currently possible to predict an earthquake. We can make an estimate about how likely an earthquake may happen over a certain period of time, but uh, currently we do not have the ability to predict earthquakes. So what kind of precautions can people take in an area like this? Uh, well, there were three uh, main natural disasters that occurred during this earthquake. The ground shaking from the earthquake, and that can cause buildings to collapse, the tsunami, and the landslides. There were quite extensive landslides in the mountains, in the valley floor where the city is located, and along the coastline. And so in terms of the earthquake ground shaking, the best mitigation for that is to design buildings to withstand the ground shaking. And the uh, people who run uh, the organizations that manage how you build a house, that's those are the people responsible for enforcing those laws. Um, in terms of landslides, one would want to hire a, an engineering geologist to evaluate the, the possibility of a landslide where, where one is living. And in terms of tsunamis, I mentioned that people need to know that they have the ability to evacuate when they are notified by a potential tsunami and that notification is the ground shaking from the earthquake. All right, thanks, Jay. That's uh, geophysicist Jason Patton talking to us from Arcata in California.